Live from Gladstone Camp Meeting, it's Gladstone Today with Jonathan Russell and Laura Pascoe. Good evening and welcome to Gladstone. Well, this is Gladstone Today. Welcome to Camp Meeting 2020. This is the ISERV Camp Meeting and we are so glad that you're joining us. And I've got to say, Laura, this is not the way we dreamed of it. Looks a little bit different, doesn't it? If you look behind us. In, in fact, last <laughs> year we would not have been able to be sitting here. There yeah. would have been masses of people eating. And we'd be and getting all that. ketchup all over our shirts as people are smoothies, you know. Not yeah. happening here. As we get started today, we just want to say we miss you. Yeah. It is so heartbreaking for us to be here on Gladstone campus today and to have only about 20 people to put together a worship service. Camp meeting is built for like 7,000 people to come together. Absolutely. But we are here doing our best, hoping that we can give you an amazing experience this week um, and help, help us all feel more connected because I think that's what we're looking for this year at camp meeting. That's it. So we're glad that you found us. We're glad that you are a part of the journey here today. Absolutely. So this week, our whole, ser our whole theme is, this is how I serve. So you're gonna hear stories throughout the week of how different people are finding ways to serve in their own Christian life and what that means. Jonathan, you sat down with our president, Dan Linrood. I sure did. Lucky you for an yes. interview this week and uh, earlier this week. And tonight, rather than, you know, me giving my best idea of what he thinks camp meeting is about, how about we just let him do it in his own words? So here's your interview with Dan Linrood. Today we're sitting down with Dan Linrood to just talk about life in the Oregon Conference, to talk about what our conference family has been through recently. And Dan, I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking time. I know you're a busy guy, especially with camp meeting and with everything you've been involved with. Thank you so much for taking some time to sit down with me and just talk. It's a privilege. Thank you, Jonathan. So here we are on the first day of camp meeting when we're going to be able to watch this piece of this interview. Uh, the, the theme for camp meeting is I serve. Tell me a little bit about how that came, apart, came about. Why is that important for us right now? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, we, we talked on our team about how did we want to approach the idea of, uh, of service with camp meetings theme. Focus for the year is serving Jesus and others, which is part of our Oregon Conference mission value. Uh, it's our third value. And so as a part of that, we said, what, what does that look like in the life of God's church? And there was some talking about maybe we should talk, have it be we serve, you know, we're serving together. We're a community of people serving. But as we back that up and we, we looked at, well, what does that look like? We realized that that we never get to we serving together unless we're all serving individually as well. And that service really is something that happens um, individually on a continuous basis um, every day throughout the week, throughout the month, throughout the year. Uh, it's part of a way of life, a posture, a direction of life and habit of life that we develop. And so that's why we went with this theme I serve because when I serve and you serve and then we come together, we serve. I love that. So I want to take one step back even from there. So what does serving Jesus and others, how does that fit so significantly into our conference mission? Yeah, well, part of it is meeting needs all around us. And um, when it comes to serving others, it's about looking at what are those needs. Now, our four values are knowing Jesus and others, loving Jesus and others, and serving Jesus and others, and then sharing Jesus with others. And so before you get to serving, just as the last two years we've been focusing on the knowing Jesus and others and then the loving Jesus and others, you have to come to know what who the person is, what their needs are, what their circumstances are, and then have a deep compassion, a love, a caring for them, that out of that comes the serving. 
And so that's how these all work together. And, and why serving is so important is because that's when knowing and loving becomes activated. I so appreciate hearing you talk about that, just putting it all together in context. Now, we're sitting on a campus that should be bustling with over 100 yeah. pastors right now. Yeah. Um, this camp meeting is unlike anything we've ever seen, at least in my lifetime. Um, how have you been processing that? Well, you know, I, I would say the first, the first aspect of processing it, honestly, is grieving. Mm -hmm. um, it's grieving the loss of the sense of community that happens when uh, all of God's people gather from far and near and we do this thing called community together, whether it's the first stages of the setup that happens with our pastors and their families and, and uh, you know, anybody who's a volunteer and helps to do the setup of the campground for camp meeting, or whether it is the actual camp meeting experience itself when our members from across the, the conference and far beyond uh, show up and are on campus together. And so it's the grieving of that. I think then secondly comes the question of how are we going to engage people in a very different kind of camp meeting experience, which you and your team have been doing a tremendous job of trying to solve that that puzzle piece. And we're going to learn a lot as we do this. We're not going to get it perfect. We know that. Uh, but your team has been doing an amazing job of making sure that we get that as good as we can get it. And I just really appreciate that. So I want to take a, one more step back a couple months as we're in the middle of pandemic and we're looking forward at camp meeting. What was it that you looked at that said there's still something? What were you hoping to preserve about camp meeting in going online this year? Well, you know, even though people won't be gathering physically here on this campus, there is a sense of being part of a larger community by just gathering and connecting into these various digital services. Sure, it falls far short of the physical experience, but um, our members are safer, and that's a very important thing. And so I think what we wanted to do was still have an experience that people could tap into. You know, the other aspect of camp meeting besides community that's so significant is the time of um, spiritual growth, mm -hmm. of, of learning and, and being built up and edified in the Lord uh, in, in a whole spectrum of ways. Uh, and content. And so it's an opportunity uh, not just to have times of worship, uh, times of biblical teaching, deep biblical teaching, or practical biblical teaching, uh, but it's uh, also an opportunity for people to tap into various seminar options that will give them a chance to develop and grow in some specific aspect of their walk with God and how they can best serve Jesus and others. It was a lot of fun to be able to sit down with Dan, and actually we had a much longer conversation than you just saw. So we're excited to be able to share a little bit of that interview with Dan Linrood each night here at Gladstone Today. So we hope that you'll be back 7 o'clock tomorrow night for the next segment in that. Now, as long as I have been going to camp meeting at Gladstone, one of the cornerstones for me has been the ABC sales. There's nothing like taking a case of Big Frank's home, for instance. Um, so this year, obviously, obviously, it's a little different for the ABC. Uh, without the thousands of people here on the campus, things have changed. Uh, but the ABC is still here. We wanted to share a little bit about how they're doing. Take a look at this. So we're four months into a global pandemic that has basically shut down everything around us. And while things are beginning to reopen, we have all seen the stories in the news of stores that we love going bankrupt and closing their doors. So some of you may be asking, how's the ABC doing right now? In talking with Steve Hilde, there's something that was interesting that happened shortly after the pandemic began. The stores all around started closing. They actually had a case sale here at the ABC and people started streaming in to stock up on their pandemic supplies. 
Uh, that has been an incredible blessing for the ABC because where other stores have been struggling, the ABC continues to hang in there. Now, that being said, this week we expected to have thousands of people on, that, on this campus. And, well, as you know by now, there are far less than thousands. The ABC still appreciates the support of Adventists because, after all, it's not just a store. It's a ministry to help all of us have the resources that we need to do the life that God has called us to. If you're in the area, stop by. Support the ABC by picking up some canned food or some health food or a book or a Bible. If you're not in the area, you still have a couple of days, especially if you're in Southern Oregon, to be able to call in your order, to pay for it over the phone, and then be able to have it delivered to you just next week. Together, we can help the ABC continue to be an important ministry of this conference well into the future. There's a lot of things about uh, camp meeting this year that are di that's different. One of them that was unexpected is that this year we started camp meeting at 7 a.m. instead of 7 p.m. There was way too much content for us to share in the time that we had, so we had to start this morning. And I'll tell you, it has been a busy day with a lot mm -hmm. of really, really fun moments. Laura, what was one of your best moments today at camp meeting? <laughs> My favorite moment, I wish you could have been here. Um, do you remember the Mr. Rogers video where he starts out like, oh, hello, friends. Um, our friend Rob had that moment today when his segment started and he had his sound canceling headphones on and he didn't know his segment had started. And so here we're in the dark Holden Center and um, all of a sudden he was rolling live and he didn't know it. And then it all of a sudden hit him that he wasn't. So he turned very Mr. Rogers like it was like oh well hello and honestly it, we were dying it was a fantastic room. moment <laughs> it, it was. really was and he um, did well he didn't like he didn't freeze or anything he did great Rob is a great guy he played it off <laughs> so well so and it well. was a very fun segment if you want to see that moment actually the whole segment with Tom Evans is absolutely fantastic uh, Tom's series this week you want to participate in my favorite moment was when you were interviewing Dr. Sung Kwan <laughs> and his Zoom call just cut off. Just dropped. And it just dropped out of nowhere. And all of a sudden, you had to make things up. And you're pretty <laughs> good at that, like making things up. Um, but even then, it was really, really something. It was something. Here's the thing. If you haven't seen the content from today, uh, go back and watch it. If you're in the app, you can go back and click the live video. We really, um, we had some special moments today. And yeah. so go back through and enjoy the content from Tuesday. So even though we're not here in person, we're still praying for each other. And I wanted to, or I was asked to deliver the message mm. that if you have prayer requests that you want us to be praying for at camp meeting, you can actually email us. Um, the email address, I have it here called to pray at gmail.com or I think there might be a button in the app called yeah. prayer. Uh, so grab Jump the onto the plaza, app. I think. It, there's plaza or prayer. By yeah. the way, we would love to see where you're watching from. Yeah. How can we see where they're watching from, Laura? They can go to the plaza and one of the pictures most recently, Jonathan just snapped one of us and saying, oh, we're live. So we want to see where are you watching camp meeting from? Is it your favorite chair? Is it your back porch? You know, that's one bonus. I don't know how much we all liked those benches. So there's so much to miss about camp meeting this year, but a bonus is you get to sit in your favorite place and watch it. So we would love to see where that is. So jump in the app and let us know, share a picture, share a message about where you're watching, what you're appreciating about camp meeting. We'll look forward to dialoguing with you there. Now, one thing that I learned when I was a youth and young adult pastor is that fellowship happens best over food. <laughs> I think that's why the snack shack is such an important part of Gladstone tradition. Absolutely. And I, it's been funny, the, some of the most uh, energetic feedback we've gotten from people as we have been talking about an online camp meeting has been, how do I get my snack shack food? <laughs> well, it's hard for us to deliver you snack shack food through your camera, but we thought the next best thing was to put together a segment that we would call snack shack at home. Yeah. Doesn't that sound like fun? Good idea. If I can't have a pronto pup here, at least we can learn how to make one at home. 
Well, tonight we're not sharing about Prano Pups. Tonight we're sharing about a snack food that has only been around Gladstone for about three years. But in that three years, it has really taken off. And it has been carried around in strollers, on golf carts, in hands, and every which way. I'm talking about kettle corn. And tonight we wanted to share a little bit about kettle corn and how it's made. So we've had a lot of people ask us, so how do you make okay. this stuff that tastes so good? So the, the short answer is it's oil and sugar and popcorn, and when it pops, put a little salt on it. That's the trick, that's the trick. our kids were growing up, we always worked with Pathfinders and helped them uh, with camperies and skills and the things that you do with kids at that age. And um, after I retired from Adventist Health, uh, we were looking for ways to help give back to some of the kids that, uh, that we work with now. And my brother was cooking kettle corn in Florida to help kids raise money down there. I said, why not? We went down and learned how to do it and uh, caught the bug, came back, found some equipment here and uh, we begin doing that ministry to help kids raise funds here in the Northwest. It is all about the kids. Um, we've had opportunity to help with fundraisers for Rivergate, for Auburn Adventist Academy, PAA, as well as multiple Pathfinder clubs in Florida, in Washington, and in Oregon. Well, How do you make it at home? A ton and a half of popcorn. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we just take oil, um, heat that up until it's ready to put the corn in. That's a uh, trade secret that we use. And we uh, add the corn. When the corn is just at the right temperature, we add sugar. And then the magic happens. We have a wooden paddle that we stir it with. And in that stir is what makes that corn cook the way it should and then you have to make sure that at the time that it's ready, you get it out of the kettle very quickly so it doesn't burn. Uh, we then get it into the sorting table, we sort all the old maids out, and we add salt there, measured amounts of salt to make it just the perfect mix of sweet and salty, and then you'll have to try it. And you can try it, and you should, and so should I. I will say, though, I think making it at home, I don't know about you guys, but they lost me with the ton and a half of corn. I will not be getting that size of corn, in which case, I think the only shot I have of getting kettle corn is if we buy it here. And if you are in this area, jump on the app, and you can buy kettle corn and Fronto Pups and Shamburgers all on Thursday if you're here in Gladstone or in Salem on Wednesday. You gotta That's tomorrow. Oh, that is tomorrow. That's tomorrow and so you need to jump on the yeah, jump on the app and place your order. I know the numbers have been skyrocketing. They have a lot of orders already. So the store opened twenty eight hours ago. Take a guess at how many sales they've made. In dollars? $1,500. It's at least $1,700 the last time I checked a couple hours ago, and it may be approaching two grand by now. There are people that really want their Pronto Pups, Shamburgers, and Kettle Corn. So you're, you're, it's not going to be in here. It's going to be drive through and safely done, but make sure you go to the app if there's a little snack shop, shack icon That's and it. click it, and you can hit buy now and get yours ordered today. So Pronto Pups, Shamburger, and yes, Kettle Corn, you should try some. There you go. So in the Oregon Conference over the last year and a half, we have been making an intentional effort to be able to expand our digital footprint and to find ways to connect more meaningfully with our members and with the public through social media. Uh, so tonight, for our last segment, I had the privilege of interviewing Caleb Isley yesterday to talk about, uh, well, social media, to talk about Oregon Adventist Stories. Here's Caleb Isley, editor of Oregon Adventist Stories. 
Caleb, welcome. Thank you, Jonathan. Glad that you're here to uh, chat with us uh, for Gladstone today. Mm -hmm. um, Caleb, you have been affiliated or associated with the Oregon Conference for well over a year now. Yep. And for those who maybe haven't caught up with you yet, tell us a little bit about the project that you're involved with for us here in Oregon. Sure. So I run a project called Oregon Adventist Stories. You may notice that a couple times a week you see a member from the Oregon Conference or someone connected to the Oregon Conference somewhere uh, showing up and sharing their story. And behind that story is a couple of people. One is me. And it is usually me sitting with uh, the person who shows up in the story or, in the case of COVID-19, giving them a phone call. Social media has this reputation for just dividing and destroying mm -hmm. relationships. How have you used social media to do the opposite? I think that's true. I think social media can be a really toxic place and a place that just makes a lot of people angry. Um, but my philosophy is kind of, I mean, the worst things are the more opportunity there is to do something different. And so what I've done is instead of kind of bringing up more arguments by just kind of throwing out theology without context at people or anything like that, going back to the basics of the human experience. What is it like to live on planet Earth and in our case as Seventh-day Adventists? And so what I've done is I've gone around and interviewed about 500 Seventh-day Adventists in the past three years. And in sharing their stories uh, instead of maybe arguments, what we do is we create a place where people can, from all sides of wherever they're coming from, whatever their perspective is, come in and just hear an experience. They can, they can take a few moments to step into another person's shoes and see life uh, through that person's eyes. You know, the conclusions are yours to come to. As the reader, you can agree with or disagree with whatever you want in that story, but you really can't argue with the fact that someone lived this. And so I think it, it's, a, it's an empathetic way to um, draw us both closer together with the person sharing, but also really open our eyes to the, the variety and diversity of experiences that Seventh-day Adventist humans live through. You know, we interview everyone from the new convert who doesn't know our theology yet to the, you know, patriarch or matriarch of the church that knows every detail of, of its history. Um, and through that, we're constantly just building bridges between people. You know, I, I think that um, just seeing that so many different people of different walks of life uh, all believing in the same God and all hoping for Jesus' return uh, has given me so much, so much hope. And it's taken that pressure off of any local church that I belong to to be everything of God to me. Every month or so, we get a question on one of our Oregon Adventist stories, and it's happened at least once a month. Why don't you put the name on the story? There's a psychology in social media storytelling that when you include the name, the name is the first and possibly the only thing that's read. Um, especially within a small, tight-knit community of Seventh-day Adventists, uh, people's thoughts will immediately jump to the last name and their memories with them, maybe, or their, even their conflict with, with a certain family. But the point behind this, the psychology behind this, is to focus on the story itself, not that individual, all of the things that are tied to them. For example, um, if you are a conservative Christian or liberal Christian, or you find yourself in a very kind of polarized area of Christianity, it's very easy to, to try to find out where that person stands and, and, and whether you agree with them. And what happens is if you disagree with them, you throw out their story. You throw out all of the complex details that led to where they are. And in taking away that aspect and taking away the gossip and taking away the, the tension there and just sharing the story, I think you build empathy much faster uh, because it's, it's just about the specific experience that somebody's had. I know that you were just participating in a seminar earlier today. <laughs> Tell me, what were you sharing about? Why should people go back and check out that content? Social media storytelling, I think, is the easiest way that churches can go about creating content online. Uh, we want way more than just posting your potlucks, your business <laughs> meetings, all of this information that's only for church members. And I want to walk people through how to create something from the people you have uh, for free, to better connect with both your community and to better connect the people within your church together. Any other projects you want to promote while you're here? Absolutely. I collaborate with uh, another one of our Oregon Conference people, Justin Koo, on a project called I'm Listening that's uh, almost exclusively with not Adventists. It's about listening to uh, people in our community and our lives that we may even disagree with. Um, I also produce uh, two additional stories a week on a project called Humans of Adventism, which you can find on Facebook and Instagram as well. All right. Thanks for the time, Caleb. So glad you're here to join us. What a blessing those Oregon Adventist stories have been in this conference. I know I have loved watching them and I will continue to look forward to seeing more from Caleb. 
You know what? We are done out here tonight. Uh, we are getting ready to go inside and be led in worship by the remix team. And then I am really looking forward to hearing a message by Jose Rojas tonight. So I hope that you enjoyed our night out here tonight. Please join us as we go inside for worship. Good night. Good night. Good evening. It's Tuesday, July 21, 2020, and as you can see, this is a unique camp meeting. Camp meeting 2020 is happening virtually because of COVID. COVID-19 has caused a pandemic globally that has affected the Oregon Conference as well. I'm going to take this thing off now so that I can just talk to you here in this studio where we're already safe. But that's why we're coming to you digitally and through this new platform. It is because we want everybody to be safe. And in this context, we don't even have to wear this when we are physically distanced, as we are. And, uh, and so this is an opportunity for us to bring camp meeting to you in a new way. I'm looking forward to all that camp meeting 2020 has to hold. While we will all grieve being apart during this camp meeting time in terms of our gathering here at Gladstone campus, we can all grow in uh, our understanding of scripture, in different classes, in the worship that we have here each evening in the evening meetings. So I want to welcome you to Gladstone Camp Meeting 2020. We're glad you've chose to join us. Welcome to a 2020 camp meeting. Um, we're glad to be here, and, and we just love it if you could worship with us. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see. to see Shining in 
to see you. Holy, 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 I want to see Hello, church family. My name is Tim Taylor. I'm part of the Outreach Ministries team, and I work with local churches in preparation for Evangelism Reaping series. This year has definitely been a challenging one. Individuals, families, and churches have faced unexpected and unprecedented change. Change can be uncomfortable, but if we let it, it can often open up opportunities that may never have otherwise been possible. I'd like to share with you about one way the Oregon Conference Outreach Ministries team has been adapting to change. This fall, we have decided to move all our major evangelistic events online. In fact, we have even launched a brand new online evangelism platform called Max Life Events. This platform appeals to people from secular and diverse backgrounds. We are partnering with various speakers to provide some full-length series as well as shorter bridge events that add value to people's lives in meaningful ways. Local churches all over Oregon are already signing up to participate in this exciting opportunity for reaching their communities online. If you would like to be a part of this initiative, visit maxharvestchurch.com forward slash online 2020. We believe that online evangelism will have relevance for many years to come. We're just getting started, and we want to invite you to join us on this journey. I'm very excited to share with you that there is a $150,000 matching donation that has just been pledged for evangelism right here in the Oregon Conference territory. This means that every dollar you give, up to $150,000, will be matched. What an incredible opportunity for your investment in evangelism to be doubled this year. You can make your donation at the Oregon Conference website. Simply go to OregonAdventist.org, go to the Donate button in the top menu. Once you are in the Adventist giving area, select Oregon Conference Evangelism. The Camp Meeting app also has an option to make your donation. I hope and pray that you will partner with us to make an eternal impact for God's kingdom. Thank you.
uncertainty and things changing around us, Lord, but we know that you're the only thing that never changes. We also know that your promises are not changing. And we want to claim a promise today. You promised that when we ask for it, you're going to pour your Holy Spirit in the the place where your children are gathered. And even if it's virtual, Lord, we want to invite you today. We want to claim that promise. And we want to ask you to pour your Holy Spirit on Pastor Rojas. Bless him and give him the words that our hearts need to hear today. We also want to ask for a special blessing and pouring of the Holy Spirit and everybody that's following along in this camp meeting. Bless each home and open up our hearts and our minds and allow us to let go of any prejudice, any worries, any COVID thinking, and just focus on you right now, Lord. We ask that you use Pastor Rojas as a vessel to give us the message that you have for us today. We can't wait to see you when you come back. We love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. Welcome to Oregon Camp Meeting. This year is different. The closest person to me is about 30 feet. Uh, Camp Meeting is usually where thousands crumple against each other and fight for the veggie meat sales. And it's amazing that we face what amounts to a biblical event. This is like any of the other plagues we've read about in scripture, it's worldwide. But we've been admonished, don't be afraid. Even though there's suffering around us, God is near. He has not forsaken his own. We're here at camp meeting because there's a vision here by the leadership, which I congratulate that you've been praying together. And many, many other fields, other conferences are joining these meetings as your own. Welcome. There are individual churches and people and groups and homes who are tuning in. Welcome. Oregon Conference's vision is simple. I remember in 1983, uh, I received a, an underground cassette, it was called back then. And this cassette was uh, of a presentation that a young man named Steve Jobs had made uh, to uh, a group of uh, uh, computer programmers and futurists in what is now called the Silicon Valley in Mountain View, California. He, he talked about that in the future, we would have computers available to everybody. In fact, he said, one day we will hold our computers in the palm of our hands. This was shocking for me to hear because I was a computer programmer uh, programming on basic back then on an Apple IIe and this was the CEO of Apple with their little machines which I thought were already the best that's ever been. He said one day we'll hold it in the palm of our hands and one day we will be able to listen to our music on the palm of our hands and I didn't know how a turntable with my favorite album and a needle was going to fit in the palm of our hands. You see, when you look at the future, you can see things that the average person's never dreamed of. And and Steve didn't stop there. He says, we'll be able to, to bring down what we call download our favorite movies. And of course, back then they were VHS video cassettes. And if you had a, a, a what do you call it, membership to Blockbuster movie, and, and they made all their, their money on late fees because you never returned them on time. The idea of a VHS cassette being reduced to something in the palm of my hand was beyond what I even knew how to imagine. Well, this guy, only a few years later, like uh, 10 years later, moved in because the next year he, he announced what was called the Macintosh. I was in shock. It took me till 1986 to get my first one. And I couldn't believe how simple the concept of a mouse with a long tail connected to the computer and typing and fonts and graphics. And I made my own uh, 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 what was called desktop publishing. New terms were being invented. 
I'll never forget it because as the Macintosh grew and grew, one day he said, you must be the computer. The vision is that the computer becomes an extension of yourself. And the next release of the Mac was called an iMac. I'm the Mac. That, that, that's a powerful concept, that the computer is the extension of me. If you bought any other computer, the manual was this thick, and you'd be leafing through pages to try to figure out how to run your computer constantly. But the Macintosh was made so that even a child could sit down and immediately discover and create. And as you used it, the Mac truly became an iMac. Windows uh, d did its best to duplicate the process in other machines. Uh, suddenly, international business machines, the IBM that had run the world to that time, including the Pentagon, I'll never forget this because it was uh, Popular Mechanics 1959, and, and they had an IBM in the Pentagon, and, and they interviewed some people there, and Popular Mechanics uh, said, in the future, this is in 1959, the computer of the future will weigh less than one ton and it will fit in one room. Steve Jobs made it an iMac. And then the day came where I began to see what he was talking about in 1983 with the iPhone. Suddenly, my computer is in the palm of my hands. I can download my favorite songs, which drove Hollywood and Nashville and Motown crazy because no longer can they monopolize music. Now you could, you didn't have to go to Tower Records anymore. You can download your favorite song without having to buy the entire album. Then without the permission of Hollywood and the other centers, you can download your favorite movie. I phone i mac so it's not just a phone it really is an extension of who we are try to live three days without your phone i bet you won't make it to three hours the idea of this being an extension has come to pass it is who we are and and uh, to tell a congregation to turn off their phones doesn't work they're quietly putting it on silent and texting while you're speaking, as you are doing right now. This guy's weird. He should shave. Amen. I know what you're texting. You see, the power of this, it, it has redefined. It's not just a phone. It's an iPhone. And Jesus made it clear. It's not just believe. It's about I believe. To, it led one person to finally exclaim, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. I believe too. You see, the power of I, when it's not selfish, is when you apply it to yourself. And that's why Florida Conference, it's not just serve. It's not just the value and the biblical power of service. It's I serve. It's an extension of who we are. Check it out. I'm going to do this, but let's pray first. The power is that I alone can do certain things. I have a unique collection of gifts. You have a unique collection of gifts. We each are so different. It's, and if each of us decides, I serve, I serve, I serve, then we are serving. Congratulations, Oregon. This is great vision. The power of making it personal. It's time, brothers and sisters. Our nation's in trouble. The world is in trouble. We have a pandemic that is still in the throes of its first iteration. There's still another one coming. It's not a, <clears throat> it's not a time to be afraid. It's time to ask ourselves, what can I do? Not just what can my money do, and we're grateful for sacrificial giving because we're needing it more than ever before. But it's not just what can my money do, what can my hands do to relieve the suffering of someone else. Just tonight before I came up on stage, I received word that another dear friend of mine has been hospitalized with COVID in South Texas. 
now in the East Coast, in Washington, D.C., all the way to New York, just in Maryland alone, we've seen 46,000 cases and lots and lots of our, our neighbors, the sick, many neighbors, friends, colleagues. Some of you have been spared the brunt of this. Don't debate it. Ask, what can I do? Like those two men told this paralytic at the gate, beautiful in scripture, silver and gold have I none. But what I do have, I give to you. Get up. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. God wants to do miracles again. And he chooses to do them through his people. Here am I, O Lord. Send me. So let's bow our heads and pray about this. Join me. Father in heaven, come down. Bless us. We are in severe danger on this planet. The economy is melting down. Lord, we are fighting amongst ourselves. Everything needs to be addressed. It's time. Invade us with the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Awaken us. Call us for such a time as this. So now, Lord, I empty myself before you. Save me that I can speak of salvation with another. Speak, Lord, for we are listening. In the name of Jesus, amen. I'd like to read to you from the book of Mark. The book of Mark, chapter 10. Beginning with verse 35. Another one of the scenes of the disciples fighting over who's going to be first in the kingdom. I know that's never happened at your church. Who's going to make first elder this year? Who's going to be head deaconess? I know that's never happened. I know you all get along really well in the congregation and never had any issues. I'm, I'm stalling to give you time to find it, those of you who are looking it up. Mark chapter 10, beginning with verse 35. And I'll just read the narrative and then comment. And James and John, the sons of De Zebedee, came unto Jesus, saying, Master, we would that you should do for us whatever we desire. So far, the prayer looks good. And Jesus said to them, What is it that I should do for you? They said unto him very humbly, Grant unto us that we may sit one on your right hand and one on your left hand when you get to your glory. But Jesus said unto them, you don't know what you're asking for. Can you drink of the cup that I'm going to drink of? Uh, can you be baptized with the baptism I'm going to be baptized with? You see, drinking his cup means you're going to be beaten within an inch of your life. And baptism is you're going to die on a cross. And uh, then uh, uh, verse 39, and they said unto him, yes, we can. And Jesus said unto them, you will indeed drink of the cup that I drink. And with the baptism that I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand or on my left hand, it's not mine to give. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the other ten disciples heard this, they began to be very displeased with James and John. And Jesus called them to himself and said unto them, you know that that which those are which, that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles, you know, government leaders, they exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise power upon them. But verse 43 changed my life. But it will not be so among you. You will not be lording power over each other the way governments do. It will not be so among you. And Jesus said, But whoso will be great among you will be your servant. And whoever will be the chief, the greatest, shall be the servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. 
the power of the ministry of Jesus is that he didn't come for us to serve him. He came to serve us. When he washed his disciples' feet, these were simple, consistent examples. I didn't come to do what you guys are used to doing. The human nature of this is to always be fighting over who's going to be number one. And whenever you've heard this story over the years, you, you, you've no doubt been like me. Look at these selfish guys, you know, taking care of business. Well, he'll be prime minister and I'll be the assistant to the prime minister. That's, the kingdom of God is not who's in charge. But we keep thinking that's the case. You know, if they would just make me an elder, we would solve this on the board. No, you wouldn't. Whether you're the elder or somebody else is the elder, the board, just they just like fighting. It's human nature. I don't know why. But put two humans in one room. There are two things they can't argue about. Religion or politics. It's true. Don't try this at home. But that's how folks do it. They, 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 if it's about the political world, it's the liberals and the conservatives, and each is convinced that the death is impending by the hand of the other. And if it's about religion, well, we're not supposed to do this, and we're some, well, this music, this, and the mustaches that are appropriate, and those which are not. You see, the human nature is to be number one. And the powerful part of this story is that Jesus did nothing to correct the number one need that these guys had, that the need to be number one was not in his answer. I liked what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did in his analysis of this passage. In his exegesis, he performed an assessment of, of, of Sigmund Freud and, and Joseph Adler, two leading psychologists whose research continues to impact among the many other psychologists of today. And uh, Freud said that the primal need of humans, the, 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 the essential or the essence of humanity is sexual. That was, that's why you have these Freudian things that people talk about. And um, some people give an idea that that might be true, but that's not the case. While God gave us that gift, that's not the essence of who we are. Joseph Adler came up with another suggestion in his research that I found most helpful in my journey. He said that the greatest need of humanity is to be distinguished, to, to, to be special, to be noticed. Have you ever watched children playing? There's always the loud one, there's always the bully, there's the popular one, there's the one sitting out there on the edge watching, that was always me, with the notoriously low self-esteem that never seems to go away. And you watch from a distance because you're afraid of being hurt, either physically or emotionally or otherwise. But the kids want to be distinguished. The best soccer player, the best basketball player, the best whatever. Have you ever served a, a table surrounded by kids? And uh, their pieces of pie, which one will everybody go for? The one they consider the best piece, which is the largest piece yeah uh, notice how it doesn't matter how old the child is i've seen 65 year old children fighting over the size of piece that they got how come i got this little one the power of wanting to be distinguished to get the best to be the best to be recognized as the best that is i think pretty accurate and the disciples knew that Jesus was Mashiach, that he was the Messiah, the anointed one. And, but they, they had come to expect a, a military general instead of the savior of the world. They just thought it would be the savior of a nation. And they thought that he would be a general who would drive out the Romans militarily and set up the crown in Jerusalem again, like King David come back. But Jesus had a bigger vision than that. It was universal. It was the salvation of the entire planet. And these guys are fighting over when you set up your throne in Jerusalem, who's going to be prime minister? I'm qualified. I've been fishing for 30 years. I know how to catch fish, and I'll do that politically. 
It's interesting how people want positions. I remember one guy said, I've been passed over for elder for three years now. And I said, well, you just messed it up. You're going to be passed over on your fourth year. You don't talk to me like that. You can't demand a position. Those things are led by God. You want to hear some trivia? I never was elected an elder in one of my churches where I was a member. Not once. And I was never elected a youth director in any of the churches where I served uh, as, a, as a, a, a person growing up after my baptism in 1970. I, ne I never got elected a youth leader, and I ended up being the leader of the youth of this denomination. It's impressive how God has his own plan that's bigger than us. You can't ask for a position. The humility is servanthood. And, but Jesus didn't say, shame on you guys for wanting to be number one. He says, I know what you guys are talking about. But government leaders, they lord over people and, and exert power over them. It will not be that way with you. Whoever wants to be great, watch, check this out. Be a servant. That was very humbling. We want people to serve us. But when we have to serve and if you want to be the greatest of all, be the servant of all. I'll never forget it. I, I was at the White House. Uh, we were eating breakfast in the state dining room. Great food. I highly recommend it. Whenever you're in Washington, drop into the White House. It's good food. Anyway, I, I was sitting over with Office of Management and Budget, and we were discussing issues, and we had an agenda that day for the meal. And... and um, Nature calls. So remember when you go to those events, go to the restroom first because your body has a way of just everything becomes quite functional at the right moments. <laughs> and so I, I, I approach the doors and a soldier clicks his heel, a Marine, and opens the door like a robot. It's amazing. You get chills down your spine. I'm still inspired by the uniform of our great nation. Those guys still give me chills down my spine. I come from an army family, and we have served for generations honorably and proudly. And to have this young man click his heels, and, and then there's an Air Force uh, a person who's in charge of anything you need. I said, restroom, oh, downstairs, go down the east uh, wing, and the, the president's library, that's where the men's restroom is. Oh, thank you. Well, very good news. And so I went down to the east wing, made my way, and I saw the library. And there was the fireplace with the rocking chair where Franklin Delano Roosevelt used to sit and talk to the American people in his fireside chats. And I went to the, perform a brief inspection of the plumbing facilities. I'm happy to report everything was in functional order. There's a reason for this detail, because I went to wash my hands, and the towels are paper, and they open up about this large, and they have a gold seal of the president on them. You think I'm going to waste that towel drying these hands? No, I dried my hands inside my suit jacket and put my towel in my pocket. I have a whole collection back at the house. <laughs> I can pay rent with those. I've seen them on eBay. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget, uh, you know, we the poor, we think different, don't we? <laughs> it's mine. Anyway, I, uh, I, I get back to the state dining room, and this is the reason I'm telling you the story. A man in a navy blue suit over here looks at me, and he says, come here. I like the turkey. Can you get me more, please? Sure. And I took his plate. <laughs> I went to the butler's. Oh, no, no we'll handle it. Oh, sure. The, the guy in the blue suit, table 70, he liked the turkey. We'll take care of it. Thank you, sir. And then I went and resumed my seat in this special location. The guy was really embarrassed. And afterwards, they, I was told by the one other Latino in the room, don't you hate it? They see us, and right away, they think we're the hired hands. And I'll never, it just came, I praise God. It came natural. I said, what an honor that even in this place, I'm perceived as a servant. 
The power of servanthood is not what position you have or what role in society you're performing. Are you serving? Yes or no. It's not about service. It's about I serve. Adler was right. We do want to be recognized. And Jesus says, if you want to be great, be a servant. If you want to be the greatest of all, be the servant of all. You see, be number one. Be number one in compassion. Be number one in loving others as you love yourself. Be number one in sacrificing your time to relieve human suffering. Be number one. Be distinguished as the person who gives of themselves like nobody's ever seen before. So be distinguished. Take that human need to be number one and serve people. It was later that Jesus, just before he ascended to heaven, he says, I was naked. You, you clothed me. I was hungry. You fed me. I was sick. You came to see me. I, I, I was a stranger. You took me in. I was, I, I, I was in, in prison and you came to see me. Well, when did all that happen? When you served them. That's what serving me looks like. It's not a social gospel. Helping a family that's suffering through COVID, their loved ones in the hospital, they can't touch them, see them talking. They need food. Take them a box of food. So you social distance. You wear your mask. You on the porch. Here it is, and then it will let us know if you need more. You see, the power is when you serve. I serve as I serve God. You understand it best in how I serve others. You see, it's not just about God saving us. It's about God using us to save others. This is a time our nation's going to need this. We're divided politically. We're divided religiously. We're divided. We don't even know how to take the pandemic, whether to wear a mask or not. While I have friends dying, as we speak, someone's telling me, why am I wearing a mask? You see, as long as we look horizontally, we'll never get it because the need to be number one will be the, I need to win this argument. And notice that you'll never win the arguments. It just gets worse. God needs a latter day movement driven by a latter reign of the Holy Spirit. A latter-day movement of people who don't just look at the horizon and say it's a mess. Now let me join the fight and see if I can win the argument. See if I can find the magic Bible verse or the magic quote from inspired writings and I can shut them all down. That doesn't work. A kid, a 17-year-old girl named Ellen Gould Harmon in Portland, Maine, had a dream. In this dream, she, she heard a voice saying, look up. Uh-huh. No, 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 no. Look a little higher. I am. No, 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 mija. You know it had, there had to be some Spanish there. <laughs> no, mija, look. Look a little higher. I am. You're starting to sound like my mom. No, she didn't say that, but if I was there, I would have said that. 17. Hello. Look a little higher, but it just, oh, she saw a path, narrow and dangerous, and people were walking upward, and there was a bright light at the end of that path, and she noticed that one or two on occasion would fall off, a narrow and dangerous path. She learned to look a little higher. And so she took the path, and it was narrow. And there were moments of danger, but she stayed on it. And she got to see a place that eye has not seen, nor has ear heard, neither had has entered into the imagination of a people what God has prepared. I mean, she saw a table miles in length, but you could easily see to the other end, and it had the most delicious foods. To me, that means enchiladas, tacos, we're talking about tamales, serious food forever and ever. 
Amen. You could tell Miss Supper, huh? <laughs> we'll get even after the program. You see, the power of this vision that she had is that she learned something that stayed with her for the rest of her life. Look a little higher. My brothers and sisters, please look at me. The time has come. We're divided among us. Jesus said a house divided against itself will not stand. He didn't say it cannot stand. He said it will not stand. We're divided politically. The sanctuary is liberal, conservative politically. We're divided over masks. We're divided over, we're divided uh, the economy. We're divided. As it was, we were already divided. Now it's times 100. Look at me, please. It's time to look a little higher. We must look above this fray for the power of the Holy Spirit to call us to something we have never done before. It is time. Enough talk. Quit showing me your Bible verses and Ellen White statements without the context of I serve. We began as a movement. Somewhere along the line, we became an institution. But I only read everywhere that it's going to end as a final movement. Because we learn to look a little higher. We need each other. People are sick that we love. Neighbors, friends, and if your area has been spared, praise the Lord. Some of us are still in the middle of this suffering. I don't know what to do. I've been I visited with a lady who had had COVID for the second time. And, and, and I, I was prepared for surgery when I went into her house. She had them fumigate and, every, and anything I touched, she quickly sprayed it and wiped it. And she gave me an orange and I peeled it. And then she scooped the, 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 the peel of the, uh, the orange and tossed the plastic bag outside. Then came and sprayed it and said, let me your hands. Lysol doesn't work on hands in terms of comfort, but it killed everything that was there, including some of my skin cells. Her husband was in a coma for his second month, and the next day he died. We've been suffering out east. Quit debating this stuff. People are dying. We need to look a little higher. We really need to. And don't be fighting over who's the deacon or the elder or whether the, you like the pastor or not. I mean, this is silly. We need to look a little higher. We need each other. Not just I serve, but if everyone's thinking I serve, then we can serve for such a time as this. And as the economy sinks in and a potential economic depression comes and we have people hungry as never before beyond the parameters of 1929 there's no room for debate there's only room for food we need to look a little higher it's time we have reached that moment who's going to be first and second in the kingdom i don't know but jesus said they will not be so among you if you want to be great be a servant. If you want to be the greatest of all, be distinguished as the servant of all. That's powerful stuff. You have to admit it. Don't just say amen. Look right now into the heavens and say, Lord, teach me. I don't even know where to begin. Teach me to look a little higher because I've been looking horizontally. I don't, there are people who haven't listened to a sermon in years. All they do is listen to make sure that it's proper in its use of Scripture and the inspired writings and if this pastor is converted or not or whether he talked about meat eating or not. Quit listening to a sermon that way. Look a little higher. Teach me something, O oh Lord. You may know 28 fundamental beliefs. But let's get to know Jesus in 28 fundamental ways by looking a little higher. Camp meeting is different. The Lord didn't call me to soothe you tonight. He called me to shove you around. I'm from the neighborhood, not the residential district. 
I always fit the profile. I'm what the bad guy looks like. Don't say anything. But you know what? I love Jesus. And this broken man only asked God for one thing tonight. Teach me, O oh Lord, to look a little higher. Want to be great? Be a servant. Want to be the greatest of all? Be the servant of all. Now, that's not Rojasian theological construct. That's the mouth of Jesus himself. We were told, and I conclude with this, that in the end, and I suggest that uh, this is looking pretty good as a, a, a shot at the end here, that we would return to a primitive godliness. You see, we become so sophisticated when we talk about the soteriological implications of justification and sanctification by faith. That's pretty sophisticated stuff. You want to hear it in primitive godliness? If you ask him to forgive you, not only will he forgive you, he'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. John 1.9. 1 John 1.9. Any questions? I like the simplicity. And Jesus said, unless you become like a child, you're not going home. To be like a child, childlike is very different than childish. I'll say that one more time for the two or three left on this planet who take notes. Childlike is very different than childish. I think enough childishness has occurred. It's time we become like a child. My mommy, my mommy, my, my, my mommy, she protect me, huh, mommy? You take care of me. Yeah, mijito, I got you. I told you. My mommy would take care of me. See, that's childlike. The tantrum, that's childish. You have to wait till you get to Walmart for that to happen. You see, the power of, it's not just to believe, it's I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Make it personal. And I know some of you are thinking, oh, I hope she's listening. She needs to hear this. Make sure that so-and-so listens tomorrow. He need Forget about them. This is for you. Hey, it's for you. God wants to speak to you tonight. Each one of us now, let's look a little higher. You see, that's how heaven comes down and fills our soul. The Lord wants to live in us not just be a belief system in our brain. Christ in me is the hope of glory. When our first child and our second child and our third child and our fourth child were born, we went crazy. I went and told total strangers that our baby was born. I, I, I went to Walmart. It's a girl. <laughs> That's nice. Um, why is he telling me? Because she was born. When it's good news and you're experiencing it, you want everybody to know. So do you believe? If you can say, I believe, Lord, help thou my unbelief, then you're ready to share what you have seen with someone else. It is Jesus who finds us. Then we respond. This pandemic has changed every rule of public presentation. I've been preaching for 46 years, and I never learned the proper way to preach. I am a narrative inductive speaker, which means we break every rule that exists. I'm an example that God could use anybody. He could use broken people from the hood, just like he can use sophisticated people that have wonderful sheltered lives. We're in it together. If I serve and you serve and you serve and you serve, then we're all serving. I'm a broken man, but I cling to him who makes us whole. What about you? This is one of my mother's favorite songs and. She's in her last stages of, of Alzheimer's, and I, I was thinking of her tonight, and I, 
I want you to hear her heart as she sang this song in my youth. <clears throat> Wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. Out in the world in darkness I walked, Jesus the Savior I met. Oh, what compassion and love he did show, he met the needs of my heart. Shadows dispelling, with joy I am telling, he made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. When at the Savior made me whole. My sins are washed away, and my night has turned to day. I walk, Jesus the Savior I met. Oh, what compassion and love he did show. He met the needs of my heart. Shadows dispelling, with joy I am telling, he made all the darkness depart. Hey. is your moment maybe you're like me for since 1970 this is my 50th year walking in this message of truth that gives me no advantage over the person who's hearing the gospel for the first time it still comes down to I believe and when you come to experience the salvation of Jesus in your own life, now you're ready to talk to another about salvation. That's what it means to serve. You want to be the greatest? Be a servant.
You want to be the greatest of all in your community, in your church? Then be the servant of all. Let us pray together. Pour out upon us, O Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit. Go beyond our opinions. Go beyond our presuppositions. Everything is changing around us, and everything we thought we can do, we're suddenly realizing only you can do. Save us, O Lord. Save us from ourselves. Come into our heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today. Come in to stay. Then shine out. Teach me to serve. If each one of us is saying, I serve, then this is a a true movement. Finish your work. Here we are. Send us. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. Go. Tell someone what you have seen. Go in peace. Well, thank you. Thank you to Brother Jose Rojas and all that he has done for us and those nuggets of wisdom. We want you to stay tuned this evening for an after show as we get to dig in a little bit deeper with a roundtable discussion with Pastor Jose this evening. So this is kind of a warning for you. If you want, uh, go ahead and get on up, take that restroom break, get a couple of more snacks, and then come right back and join us for some great content. Take this mic off. Okay.
I think they're fine. Yeah. I like this particular model. Do you have a studio at your house? Yeah. You guys should be, you, you guys should probably should, don't even need the headphones no. because you can hear each other. Quite well, yeah. No, so no ambient noise. We're all loud now. Yeah, no you're loud now. So, um, yeah. Chef, are you ready? I know. I can't see anything but you guys, so that's good. Well, hey, thank you guys so much for joining us this evening for our after meeting, if you want to call it that. And we are really happy to have you here with us tonight. And of course, my name is Pastor Chad Rising. I have the joy of serving here in the Oregon Conference. Okay, hold on. Just zoom out and zoom out. Take two. I didn't do it. <laughs> I just need to not squint. I need to not squint. Because I like when I look that way, I get blinded. That's a song. Blinded by the light. favors these and they're tight both in the same way. Be sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I prefer my Neumanns, but there goes your life savings on one mic. Some really drum, good drum mics out there. There are, there are. Yeah, but what do I know? I'm just a preacher. <laughs> so where are you at? Jose, this is Carrie. So she's uh, my coworker with me at the East Salem Church. Yeah. You at Salem? Yeah. yeah. Oh, a beautiful church. Yep, yep. Been there several times. Yep, he just got there. I just got here two months ago. Yeah. So I'm Chad. So Chad. Chad. Rising. I'm Jose Rojas. What an honor. As you can see, they don't care who preaches at cat meeting anymore. <laughs> see, I was telling Carrie the funny part is the very first time that I got to hear you was Central California Conference. I was 16 years old. So Cal? So Cal. Oh my I was already the conference youth director. No, I, I was the. Yes, test, test. Mine is very loud. Yeah, oh, that's why I haven't been talking because I heard it. <laughs> we are now testing. This is only a test. Check, 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 check. Test, test, test. Check, check. <coughs> what you need from me? Okay, it's tough for a preacher to keep talking, but I'll figure out something to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not exactly sure what we're going to talk about, but we'll so keep talking about it. I arrived in Salem two months ago, yeah. It's been two months. It's been wow. Well, I, June 8th I got here, so it's only actually it's been just, about a month and a half. It yeah. seems like 
I preached one year at the armory there in Satan oh, as well. Oh, that's a fun facility. Yeah. We're ready. Oh, okay. So here we go. In three, two, one. Well, hey, good evening, Oregon Conference family. It's so good to have you joining us here tonight at our after meeting or whatever you want to call it, the after show. And uh, my name is Chad Reisig, and I have the pleasure of serving alongside this wonderful young lady, Carrie, uh, at the East Salem Church here in the Oregon Conference. But nobody really cares about us because we're here just to just to kind of keep things moving and, and trying to keep Jose awake. <laughs> um, and so we are here, of course, <laughs> with with Jose Rojas. So welcome in. We, Thank we you. appreciate you taking the extra time this evening. So I appreciate it. When somebody meets you on the sidewalk or after a church service or whatever, you know, what's the way that you prefer to be addressed? You know, Elder Rojas, Pastor Jose. Oh or, my goodness! You know. uh, I've I've been I I get called Pastor Rojas. That's the the basic title, and I'm honored by that. To be known as a pastor is a great a great opportunity to minister with permission. Mm -hmm. uh, but I get called a lot of other stuff too. <laughs> when I used to have my social pages, I uh, um, I, I learned early. Uh, you get called as you have impacted others. If you have been a pastor to people, then they'll remember you as a pastor, right. and that's why I'm moved by that designation. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, your talk last night um, had a lot of really good. I'm going to call them nuggets of wisdom, right? So there was some really great just chunks that were in there. You had some great sayings. And so I, I wrote some of them down. I know Carrie wrote down mm -hmm. some as yeah. well. And even a few people were responding on our YouTube feed and on our Facebook feed. Thank you so much, by the way, for contributing. So your overall theme tonight was about humility in serving others. So one of the questions that I had early on was, how do you know if you're humble enough to serve others? Well, truly humble people don't know they're humble. Uh, that's the point, uh, because humble people make others first. The act of prioritizing others distinguishes you. When you prioritize yourself first, that too distinguishes you. So I've noticed over the years, uh, traveling literally the planet over and over, churches on the ground, companies, government leaders, etc., you could always spot the humble ones mm. because they make others first and you get it from a prime minister who spends 20 minutes introducing their staff whereas another prime minister didn't introduce anybody they he just would come on in and so the humility shines when you make other people first okay yeah so the proof is in the actions not necessarily in what you think but it's it's obvious in what you're doing precisely humility is a way of life it's okay. not a it's not something you put on it's it becomes who you are okay mm. okay um you had a lot in there about serving others mm -hmm. and so one of the things that that we just finished nominating committee at our church yeah. and uh one of the things that always comes up a lot of the times is there have been people that have been serving long term how do you Express what would be your nugget of wisdom for those that say, I'm burnt out from serving? Yes. What we discovered is you make uh, a nominating committee makes uh, two names. This is the director, and this is the person being mentored to be director next year. So when you publish the list to your, your, your vote uh, on a Sabbath morning with your congregation, here is the director uh, of this department. And here's the person being mentored. So in blue ink on the sheet, this is the director for the, the this next ecclesiastical year. And this is the person being mentored to be director next wow. year. So right. that person is going to learn from, from uh, being trained by the person who's been doing it and feels burned out. The person who's burned out feels great to have an assistant right. yeah. who's an eager learner and will replace them next year. So nominating committees can work in two-year uh, thinking where you have your leader who feels that they've given all they can and then the person who's going to be mentored in. I learned that from a campus chaplain who did that at, does that at one of our universities. Yeah. He always has the leader and the person being mentored in for next year. So for you already know for the next two years who's going to occupy that role. Then the other team of assistants 
wow, maybe one day I'll make the the the, the black ink right. person that works with the blue ink director. I hope that makes sense, but that that is a very practical yeah. way to give an assistant to the burnt out leader while preparing the next one. And mentoring is different than training. Training is, here's the book, I'm gonna give you the class, you've never done it before, but if you do it like this, you'll be fine. No, a mentor, watch how I do it, now you do it. And you get to see, oh, you notice how it didn't work out that way? Here's what I learned in 15 years of doing this. The mentor now not only trains, but gives the person the mindset of how to do this work. Okay, yeah. Very compassionate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I come out of the corporate world. Uh, pastoring came on later on in life for me, and we used to call that succession planning, yes. which was you're making yourself somewhat replaceable by continuing to train people that can come in and do the work that you have been doing, and so you don't burn out. And, That's right. Yeah. And some congregations have the same person been there for 34 years, and they plan on their 35th. Well, we need that kind of skill and power passed on. And now, brother, we, sister, we want you to mentor in the next three people. We're going to assign these three people to learn from you. Yeah. The nominating committee will select from one of them. It, it just, it's, that succession planning uh, can really pay off in a church setting. And if the mindset of servanthood grows in the congregation, that's going to be a real successful plan. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's serving within the church. A big part of your talk was serving outside of the church. And Carrie, you had a really good question that you were developing on that particular aspect. With serving, yeah. I, I know within our own brokenness, we feel like we aren't worthy to serve. I hear this a lot with the congregation, with, the, with members in the church. When you ask them to serve, things that have happened in their life or whatever, they don't feel good enough to serve. And oftentimes are surprised that you would ask them. So how do we overcome that feeling of not good enough to spread the gospel or serve? I think num there's two answers to that. Number one, talk to a counselor, and uh, th that's me. You're describing me, a uh, notoriously low self-esteem. No matter what I've done in my life, I still feel I've never really achieved anything. Mm. And I'm saying that sincerely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet my experiences are enormous, but I don't see it that way. So there's a, a, a sincere low self-esteem issue that someone can build upon and, and get help with. But number two is... The greatest leaders are the ones who know they're not the best. Yeah. Uh, um, in fact, the ones who think they're the most qualified, they're the ones who fall flat on their face. And I, I always talk to my nominating committees, whoever asks for the position, that's the one you don't put in. <laughs> okay, <laughs> interesting. In fact, the one that God chose is the one who says, no, not me, I can't do that. That's the person who's ready to be used mm. by God. They have wow. no confusion as to who's going to bless them as they score and do well mm -hmm. they're going to say in here i'm not able to do this it must be the hand of god wow. See? Yeah. so really that can be channeled and those are the most worthy people the ones who know they're not worthy i like it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and especially those oftentimes, I, I love the fact that you, you refer to yourself as the guy from the hood, uh, you know, something like that, uh, that there are many people that are out there that have those life experiences, mm -hmm. negative and positive, that can reach people that maybe somebody like me or somebody like Carrie could never reach. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So how do you help somebody get out of that, out of their comfort zone to assume that role, that, that right, that privilege to reach out? Well, you, you, you named it. It's the comfort zone. We're, we're afraid to leave the house. Mm -hmm. We go to the office. We go to work. We come home. We freshen up, we have dinner, prop our feet up on the couch, and we watch TV or something, and then go to bed and start again tomorrow. And when it comes to what's necessary in town, my offerings, my gifts will take care of it. Well, that was the rich young ruler. He was a very beloved man, young man in town. He was quite wealthy, and notice how his wealth was never the problem of the story because it's a gift. Some people sing, some people have, uh, are painters, some people are artists, some people, their gift is whatever they touch literally turns to cash. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's a gift from God. And like all our gifts were to use them wisely for the Lord. And I'm very proud of the people that God has blessed who work very hard and they have wealth. And th this young man was there. He, he had that. He, he was gifted and he loved his community and, and he gave 
generously to the church and to projects in the community. But Jesus told him, you lack one thing. Are you able to live without that just to follow me? In other words, is Jesus number one? Mm. Jesus was number two after his money. Mm. See, so, um, th- and not long after that, Jesus was with the disciples at the temple, and this girl walks in, a young girl with a kid. Her husband had died tragically, and she's waiting for everybody to leave. Nobody can notice, and she tosses in two mites, which is less than a penny in our, in right. our cash flow. And Jesus says, see, watch, watch. And poor girl, she doesn't know that she's being watched carefully by 12 men and Jesus. And she drops her coins in and Jesus says, she gave more than everybody else. Like the rich young ruler was confronted with, she gave all. Everybody else gave some of what they had. And so it, it's not so, so much that if God has blessed you with wealth, now you have to lose it all. No, 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 it's, it's about your mind. If you've set your mind on Christ, you give your all to Jesus. And um, I remember one person told me his testimony that he had a bakery and, and, he, and he told the Lord, I'm gonna give you a double tithe because my bakery's not doing well. Well, by the next year he had two bakeries. Then he gave a triple tithe. Then he had 12 bakeries. Mm-hmm. Then he gave half of his income in tithe. And now he has the largest bakery on planet earth. And you see his products any store you drop in little Debbie foods and so and he gives half of everything to the Lord in other words wealth is a blessing from God it's not to poor people love to criticize wealthy people because they don't (laughs) but that's why we're poor we don't that's not our gift (laughs) (laughs) anyway right (laughs) but I I'm so inspired by people who have wealth because God blessed them and not to be jealous of anyone they too face the same Mm -hmm decision we all face Mm -hmm. to make God first yeah first one of the things that you said um tonight was to look higher and sometimes I, I I feel like that can be easier said than done when you're in the thick of it and you're feel like you're being beat down and everyone's just like you know turn to God look higher and it can be almost like they're saying it just to kind of move the conversation along how do we when we are in the middle of those struggles how have you guided yourself to look higher to get to that point where you actually can i i was inspired by desmond doss who as an adventist was a uh, a non-combatant didn't believe in bearing arms because mm-hmm. of the traumatic childhood he had yet after the bombing of pearl harbor he felt the obligation to enlist and serve his country but not with a gun Mm -hmm. he wanted to be a medic and he was mistreated he was misunderstood and he learned save me help me he got court-martialed they wanted to put him in prison for the rest of the war and the lord delivered him but the moment that really changed my life was when he was in battle Uh, i was preaching to american troops in germany one year uh, I used to go about every other year to preach to the American troops and uh, who were rotating in and out of Baghdad or I mean, Iraq or Afghanistan. And, um, you know, a rock and roller saying to them, uh, comedians tell them dirty jokes, why can't a preacher come in and preach? You know? right. So, All right. Well, one year, Desmond Doss was there. And th- now, will you talk about humble again? Mm-hmm. A very unassuming, humble, loving man. And it was when he was up on on Hacksaw Ridge that night, he's gonna get off the cliff as the last guy. Mm-hmm. And they took huge casualties and uh, most of the unit was decimated that he served in and the whole, anyway, you just go right down the list. And he cried out, I can't hear you. He told God, I can't hear you. Mm-hmm. And at that moment, he hears the cries of wounded men, medic, help me. Wow. And he heard the voice of God for service. He turns around and for the rest of the night lowers 74 wounded men, including four Japanese, wounded Japanese wow. soldiers who uh, successively, uh, who died not long after being lowered of, of their wounds. I cannot, I can't hear you. And I learned to say that too. 
There are moments when I'm discouraged, <laughs> where I hit the wall, where my opponents scored against me, and uh, and it, it, I'm hurting terribly. And I'm in the car, and I just say, I can't hear you. Mm. I can't hear you. And then I get a phone call, Pastor, can you come and pray with me? I'm in the fix with this and this. To look a little higher is to look beyond yourself and your mm -hmm. own needs and your own opinions to others. And I think when Ellen White had that vision, she learned to look above it all. Because right now as a nation, yeah. we're not looking very high. We're looking at each <coughs> other and really divided. Mm -hmm. And as believers, this is our opportunity. We can come together and look a little higher. Yeah. Thank you. I'll let you ask the next question. My my throat has decided to clamp up on me a little bit. <laughs> <clears throat> I um I loved how you really empowered this I serve. Um I think that a lot of us wanna serve and sometimes we can get into it and like he talked about before, you get burnout and you can get tired and you can get discouraged. What is something that's happened in your life where you've had something like this happen, uh, where you've come back from a really bad situation and you're actually happy that maybe that situation happened because you're, it, it made you respond how you are today or be how you are today? I, I, you, you asking me to be sincere and honest on this? Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> on the air? <laughs> God has always allowed me to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. Very rarely has he ever saved me from calamity. If my loved one's sick, they end up dying. And uh, if people come after me, they succeed, <coughs> except for the few times they've come with guns to kill me. Fortunately, they didn't, screw, they didn't mm. score that one. Uh, but uh, I have not been spared of most of the stuff that happens. And that brokenness makes it clear to me that only God can take me forward. Wow. That brokenness takes away any temptation to think that I know what to do right now. Mm -hmm. And then I end up testifying afterwards. I was at a loss and the Lord blessed me. And it's amazing, it's amazing. Um, as, as ministers, mm -hmm we hit the end of the road a lot mm -hmm. i could say three or four times a year i once again say i think i'm not cut out for this <clears throat> or an opponent will tell me you should have never been a minister a lot of people are going to be lost because of you and then i tell them what if you're right will you pray with me then help me <laughs> Because I believe them. I'm so broken. You know, mm -hmm. I've been told off so many thousands of times for 46 years. I finally say, well, then will you pray with me so that maybe God will save me? And it's that brokenness <clears throat> that God will use. And this Bible has been around the world, six, six continents over and over. And I have gang members who have signed it after they get baptized. Oh, wow. wow. Inmates. Uh, I, have, I have a Juarez cartel here, inmates serving life uh, uh cities from around the world um and this bible has been stolen three times and it comes back all by itself what? like the ark of the covenant came back from <laughs> wow. the philistines That's and incredible. uh, uh and this bible has seen fifty-eight thousand baptisms wow and then with my other bible that i would use when this one was missing it comes to over sixty-five thousand baptisms and i still don't know how to win a soul <laughs> <laughs> I still don't know how to teach a class on the best techniques of bringing a soul to decision. I don't know how to make an appeal. Just up 1900 came forward in the call. I don't, I'm helplessly watching the hand of God. That is ministry. Yeah. It's not how we do it. It's what God does through us. Mm -hmm. Brokenness then can be good. So you're leading from your brokenness, yes. your pain. Instead of giving up like Jacob, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Now, he may dislocate my hip before this is over. And I have scars from the journey. But he's kept me in this for 46 years. Mm. And um, 
I thank God because if it wasn't for brokenness, I would have succumbed to pride a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He keeps me humble. See, I, I made the prayer. It's my fault. I asked the Lord, do everything necessary to keep me humble. You have to watch Ooh. what you pray for. Yeah, that's a dangerous prayer, brother. He destroys brother. me repeatedly. <laughs> he allows me to be broken. And it guarantees that I can't boast anything because I'm too broken to be that complete in my boasting. So I can only boast in the Lord. I, yeah. I can yeah. tell you what he did because I, I wasn't up to anything. My wife says, I don't know how you're still alive. Mm. We've been married 40 years, poor girl. You know, she went off and said, I do, not realizing what she was <laughs> getting into. But you see, the power of brokenness is that that is your strength to serve. And so I learned one day in Ecclesiastes, Israel was re repenting of sin and mm -hmm. then they were grieving. And the prophet told them, stop crying for the joy of the Lord. Yeah is your strength. So I, I met with my family one day when I was really broken and I had been hospitalized for it. It was that bad. And, and I just said, you know what, you guys, I have no joy of my own. I'm going to let the joy of the Lord be my strength because we, our joy is based on how we feel right now. Mm -hmm. The joy of the Lord is he knows what's coming. That's why he's pretty excited. Yeah. So his joy becomes my joy. So in, that's my strength. In a practical way, how does that work? Because you had talked about you have friends that are battling COVID right now, and you know the world is seemingly coming apart in many different ways, and people have no joy, and they say, I want the joy of the Lord, but I don't know how to allow that to come into my life. Well, it's to first accept that it's not a feeling that you have. Mm -hmm. You're accepting his joy because you don't have joy of your own. I mean, just before I came on stage for this sermon, I prayed with a fellow pastor, and it's his brother who may die. It's very upsetting mm -hmm. of COVID. And he was weeping, and I'm comforting him, and then I get up here to preach. I was broken when I got up to speak. You yeah. see my point? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yet I turn on a TV, and we're debating whether we should wear masks or not, or if I'm a patriot or something. You know what? It, it, those of us who are dealing with life and death, it's, we're looking a little higher. It's mm. more than our own opinion. Yeah. I'm a patriot. I come from a patriotic family. I love my country and the, 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 the red, white, and blue, the, the stars and stripes hang at my house, proudly so. And we wear a mask because that way I can stay healthy long enough to help someone else succumb to the illness. And so there's the power. It's not that you feel happy, is that you bring relief to human suffering and that's the joy of the Lord working through you and so his strength becomes perfected in your weakness the, the apostle said amen to that amen to that see these passages come to life now mm -hmm. yeah they have context yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Well, I think um, one more question for tonight, and then we're going to save a <laughs> bunch more. For, he's going to be with us throughout the week here, folks. So let me get my phone to turn back on here. Um, you all know how that goes. One of the things that you said was that the Advent movement began just as that, a yes. movement, and mm -hmm. somewhere along the way we, we got off the tracks, if you will. What do we need to do, not, not as pastors, not as leaders, but as members of the body of Christ, as Christians, to get it on track? I, I'm a sociologist of religion by training. I have, I have my degree in religion, but I also um, have other work that I've done. And people groups are my passion. And my focus was the study of movements. Two of my mentors worked with Gandhi, and two of my mentors worked with Dr. King. I study movements. So then I got into studying the Advent movement. A movement is when you believe in something. Mm. And we all share that belief. Mm -hmm. And we believe in it so much, we're going to act on it. Mm -hmm. It becomes a movement. And it's amazing what becomes a movement nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, Bell bottoms became a movement. We all couldn't see our feet in the 70s. And I'm proud of those pictures. But my kids laugh at me to keep them come when they see pictures of me and my bell bottom. We can't mm -hmm. see your shoes. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but I'm, I'm still proud of them. Anyway, th that was a movement. Uh, a movement for justice. A movement for reconciliation. That means enough people believe in something that they're going to do 
something about it. So that begs the question to our Adventist community, what do we believe anymore? Mm -hmm. Do we even hear a sermon to learn from it? No, Most of, many of us listen to a sermon to assure that proper orthodoxy is being, is he using Ellen White properly? Is he using scripture? You know what? Listen for a sermon and learn from it. Mm. Uh, when another pastor preaches, I, I love it because I'm always preaching. I am always serving the food. It's nice to sit down and eat once in a while. Right. Like when Pastor Dick Dirksen preaches, I eat till I can't move mm -hmm. spiritually. I mean, I eat. And the power of a good sermon is that you learn something. And I've been in this work. In, uh, I was baptized in 1970, so what's that? I've been around for 50 years in this church, and my mustache looks like it now. <laughs> I finally look my age, and I'm no longer the guy with the big black mustache. Right. And it's this camp meeting that I came out of hiding. Now I'll be the guy with the big white mustache yeah. <laughs> and good chocolate brown skin to highlight. Anyway, there you go. I, I know that was nice totally contrast, unnecessary. Yeah. Thank you. Right? Yes. What a meaningful clarification. Long story short, the idea is we began as a movement. Mm -hmm. Are you aware that uh, 13 million Americans believed in the Advent message back in 1844? Mm. Wow. It really was mm -hmm. a great mm -hmm. disappointment. Right. America was waiting for Jesus mm -hmm. to come. The nation had been reached. Mm. So we've seen a successful movement before. We were just wrong on the, on the, uh, the specifics. We learned from the mistake. And our denomination was born a little after that mm -hmm. from that movement. So then from the Advent movement came the Seventh-day Adventist Church as a movement. We, we were the leading edge of publishing that, that didn't exist in mass publishing. We Educational, sanitariums. It became a movement. The people believed in something mm -hmm. and they mobilized for it. What do we believe in now? So this camp meeting is calling people to serve with what does that mean so that's my assignment for each of these meetings mm -hmm. define what i serve means mm -hmm. so tonight it was the call of jesus mm -hmm. to be a servant if you really want to be great i commend you to be one number one but need be number one in compassion be number one in love and the fruit of that is you'll be the servant and the greatest of you the most humble of all mm -hmm. will be the servant of all yeah and um I'll give you an anecdote that changed my life. Uh, notice that I only tell stories that I believe changed my life. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to waste your time otherwise. See, <laughs> it changed my life. Okay. Uh, um, I, I, um, I have come to the point where I realize that when a movement occurs, it's bigger than one person. Mm -hmm. Civil rights became bigger than Dr. King. The liberation of India became bigger than Gandhi. This movement to finish God's work will be bigger than us. Mm. Therefore, it's not up to the president. It's not up to the administration. It's up to each one of us to be filled in a latter rain that's been promised of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we began as a movement. And in Scripture and in Ellen White, we see described only a final movement. That means we come to believe something again. And the Holy Spirit fills us. And then we do it. We serve. We have, what, over 120 hospitals in North America, the largest uh, faith-based hospital system, yeah. um, over 1,000 mm -hmm. schools. We have over 300,000 volunteers to 400 Adventist Community Service Centers. Uh, talk to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have what we call assets yeah. in people and in institutions. We are prepared to do. And if we all conclude with, not only is it service, it's I serve. Not only is it a, a, a phone, it's an iPhone. It, 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 it makes it personal. It's an extension of who I am. Service becomes an extension of what these mm. hands are. Yeah. And I believe that God has called us for such a time as this. You notice I have nothing left to lose. Yeah. I preach with abandon. Yeah. Uh, I'll eventually die, and I don't say that mournfully. But I pray that enough people will have been provoked that my little contribution will have stirred two, three people to say, I'm going to do this too. And if that happens, I lived a good life. Yeah. yeah. And I can only speak for myself, but 
just in the one talk tonight, I was blessed by what Absolutely. you had to say. Amen. And so I hope that you at home also were blessed by what Pastor Jose Rojas has had to say to us as well. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. Want to give you just a prompt for next go around as you're watching the live stream as Pastor Jose Rojas is speaking uh, in the comment field on YouTube and on Facebook. We're actually following right along with you. So if you have some questions that you would like us to bring to the table, we may go through that list and select a few and uh, be able to get some of those answers for you as well as we do this after each one of his presentations. And so we thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, would love to close with prayer tonight. And so my voice is going, so I'm going to impose upon Carrie if you'd close with prayer for us Absolutely. this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to come together when we didn't even know if we would have a camp meeting, and yet here we are joined together virtually to talk about you and to start asking some really big questions about service and how we can respond to what's going on in the world. Thank you so much for Jose tonight and his message and help it reach someone out there. There mm -hmm. is someone that needs to hear this. Help it reach that person, Lord, mm -hmm. and protect all of us as we go home and bless each person that's listening tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 Thank amen. you for joining us, everyone, this evening. May you have a blessed night.